What's better than Anchor's podcast creation tools? Nothing. Mankind has always searched for evidence of God's perfection, and we found it. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use straight from your phone or computer. The creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and uh, the lesser of the podcast platforms, Stitcher. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I've made $5, and I've been doing this for three months. So, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Before I start the show, I feel like there should be a warning. I'm reading public domain books and short stories and whatever else. Uh, Some of it may be offensive. I don't read these things before, so I don't review it. So it's kind of just by chance. So if anything in here is offensive, or most likely with these really old books, uh, bigoted, uh, don't hold me responsible. I'll be just as surprised as you are. And with that, enjoy this episode of Leaves of Glen. I... I'm Glenn Nuzzles. So what's on tap for today? We're going to be reading chapters 16 and 17 of uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray. And uh, hopefully no one will get shot and killed in a major uh, area of a city. But uh, actually no one got killed last night. I was checking out the news... And our local news stations like to report on only just the deaths that happen in our fair city. And um, there was no reporting of any deaths from last night. So whoever got shot at must have survived or they must the guy must have missed. And so my daughter luckily didn't witness an actual killing. So that's good news. That makes me feel good. Uh, but let's review what happened in the chapters I read last, uh, last time. Chapter 14, Dorian invites Alan over to help him get rid of the body. Uh, Alan is one of many, many people that have uh, scorned Dorian, want nothing to do with him. But he's brought over for whatever reason. He actually shows up and uh, uh, Dorian says, he jumps around all over the place. First he says the man committed suicide, then he says I killed him. That was a little weird. Uh, Alan just says I don't care until Dorian writes on a slip of paper some horrible secret and says, I'm going to tell everyone about it unless you get rid of this body. Magically, through the power of uh, chemistry science. So he does, and uh, the body's all gone. Chapter uh, 15 is uh, Dorian going to dinner, where he charms people. It's another chapter where hilarious anecdotes are made and great discussion. And uh, there's always an older woman who's just swept off her feet. Uh, apparently, the author loves to impress older ladies. Uh, and then uh, Henry's there, and Henry is bugging him about why he seems so weird. I was under the impression that a lot of time has passed, and that Henry and Dorian aren't really friends anymore, but apparently they hang out a lot, so I didn't get what that was about. But whatever, let's move on. Dorian goes home, knowing that he's got to see Henry the next day, which he's not really seeming to look forward to. Uh, We get to read a lot more about how exquisite everything in his house is, uh, even down to this giant chest that has a secret uh, pocket. And in there is an exquisite box that has some kind of chain. And then Dorian hits the streets. So we're going to read chapters 16 and 17 and um, try to get through this book because October's coming and I want to read short, scary stories so I want to get this book out of the way. Uh, Let's see what happens in chapter 16. Does Dorian go on a killing rampage? (laughs) Well, we'll find out. Chapter 16 A cold rain began to fall, and the blurred street lamps looked ghastly in their dripping mist. The public houses were just closing, and dim men and women were clustering in broken groups around their doors. From some of the bars came the sound of horrible laughter. In others, 
drunkards brawled and screamed. Lying back in the hansom with his hat pulled over his forehead, Dorian Gray watched with listless eyes the sordid shame of the great city. And now and then he repeated to himself the words that Lord Henry had said to him on the first day they had met. Uh, to cure the souls by means of the senses and the senses by means of the soul. All right, whatever. <clears throat> yes, that was the secret. He had often tried it and would try it now again. There were opium dens where one could buy oblivion. Dens of horror where the memory of old sins could be destroyed by the madness of sins that were new. The moon hung low in the sky like a yellow skull. From time to time, a huge misshapen cloud stretched a long arm across and hid it. The gas lamps grew fewer and the streets more narrow and gloomy. Once the man lost his way and had to drive back half a mile, and steam rose from the horse as it splashed up the puddles and the side windows of the hansom were clogged with the gray flannel mist. To cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by the means of the soul, how the words rang in his ears. His soul certainly was sick to death. Was it true that the senses could cure it and innocent blood had been spilled? What could atone for that? Ah, for that there was no atonement. But though through forgiveness was impossible, forgetfulness was possible still. And he was determined to forget, to stamp the thing out, to crush it, as one would crush the adder that had stung one. Indeed, uh, what right had Basil to have spoken to him as he had done? Who had made him a judge over others? He had said things that were dreadful, horrible, not to be endured. On and on plodded the handsome, going slower, it seemed to him, at each step. He thrust up the trap and called to the man to drive faster. The hideous hunger for opium began to gnaw at him. His throat burned and the delicate hands twitched nervously together. He struck at the horse madly with his stick. The driver laughed and whipped up. He laughed in answer, and the man was silent. That was a weird little exchange. The way seemed interminable, and it was like whipping a guy's horse, isn't that kind of like taking over the steering wheel for a little bit, and then the guy takes the steering wheel back? It was kind of strange. Uh, the way seemed interminable, and the streets like the black web of some sprawling spider. The monotony became unbearable, and as the mist thickened, he felt afraid. Then they passed by lonely brickfields. The fog was lighter there, and he could see the strange bottle-shaped kilns with their orange fan-like tongues of fire. A dog barked as they went by, far away in the darkness. A wandering seagull screamed. Screamed? <laughs> the horse stumbled in a rut, then swerved aside and broke into a gallop. After some time, they left the clay road and rattled again over rough paven streets. Most of the windows were dark, but now and then fantastic shadows were silhouetted against some lamp-lit blind. He watched them. Curiously, they moved like monstrous marionettes and made gestures like live things. Well, it's because they're live. He hated them. A dull rage was in his heart as they turned a corner. A woman yelled something at them from an open door, and two men ran after the hansom for about a hundred yards. The driver beat at them with his whip. <laughs> this is weird. It is said that passion makes one think in a circle. Certainly with hideous iteration and bitten lips of Dorian Gray shaped and reshaped those subtle words that dealt with soul and sense. Till he found uh, in them a full expression, as it were, of his mood and justified by intellectual approval passions that without such justification would still have dominated his temper. From cell to cell of his brain crept the one thought and the wild desire to live, most terrible of all of man's appetites, quickened into force each trembling nerve and fiber. Ugliness that had once been hateful to him because it made things real became dear to him now for that very reason. Ugliness was uh, the one reality. <laughs> the one reality is ugliness. The coarse brawl, the lonesome den, the crude violence of a disordered life, the very vileness of thief and outcast were more vivid in their intense actuality of impression than all the gracious shapes of art, the dreamy shadows of song. They were that he needed for forgetfulness. In three days he would be free. Drinking coffee. Suddenly the man 
drew up with a jerk at the top of the dark lane. Over the low roofs and jagged chimney stacks of the houses rose the black masts of ships. Wreaths of white mist clung like ghostly sails to the yards. Somewhere about here, sir, ain't it? He asked huskily through the tramp. Dorian started and peered round. This'll do, he answered, and having got out hastily and given the driver the extra fare he had promised him, he walked quickly in that direction of the quay. Here and there a lantern gleamed at the stern of some huge merchantman. The light shook and splintered in puddles. A red glare came from an outward-bound streamer that was coaling. The slimy pavement looked like a wet Macintosh. He hurried on toward the left, glancing back now and then to see if he was being followed. In about seven or eight minutes, he reached a small shabby house that was wedged in between two gaunt factories. In one of the top windows stood a lamp. He stopped and gave it a peculiar knock. After a little time, he heard steps in the passage. Oh, guess my kids are walking around. And the chain being unhooked, the door opened quietly and he went in without saying a word. To the squat, misshapen figure that flattened itself into the shadow as he passed, at the end of the hall hung a tattered green curtain that swayed and shook in gusty wind which had followed him from the street. He dragged it aside and entered a long, low room, which looked as if it had been once a third-rate dancing saloon. Shrill, flaring gas jets, dulled and distorted in the fly-blown mirrors that faced them, were ranged around the walls. Greasy reflectors of ribbed tin backed them, making quivering discs of light. The floor was covered with ochre-colored sawdust, trampled here and there into mud, and stained with dark rings of spilled liquor. Some melees were crouching by the little charcoal stove, playing with bone counters and showing their white teeth as they chattered. In one corner, with his head buried in his arms, a sailor sprawled over a table, and by the tawdry painted bar that ran across a one complete side stood two haggard women, mocking an old man who was brushing the sleeves of his coat with an expression of disgust. <laughs> he thinks that he's got red ants on him, laughed one of them, as Dorian passed by. The man looked at her in terror and began to whimper. At the end of the room, there was a little staircase leading to a darkened chamber. As Doran hurried up uh, three rickety steps, the heavy odor of opium met him. He heaved a deep breath, and his nostrils mm, quivered with pleasure. When he entered a young man with a smooth yellow hair who had been bending uh, over a lamp lighting a long thin pipe, looked at him and nodded in a hesitating manner. Iggy here, Adrian, muttered Dorian. Where else would I be? He answered listlessly. None of the chaps will speak to me now. I thought you left to uh, England. Darlington is not going to do anything. My brother paid the bill at least, at last. Eh. George doesn't speak to me either. I don't care, he added with a sigh. As long as one has this stuff, one doesn't want friends. I think I've had too many friends. God, everyone talks like this. <laughs> Dorian winced and looked round at the grotesque things that lay in such fantastic postures on the ragged mattresses. The twisted limbs, the gaping mouths, the staring, lustrous eyes fascinated him. He knew in what strange heavens they were suffering, in what dull hells they were teaching them the secret of some new joy. They were better off than he was. He was prisoned in thought. Memory like a horrible malady, was eating his soul away. From time to time, he seemed to see the eyes of Basil Hallward looking at him, yet he felt that he could not stay. The presence of Adrian Singleton troubled him. He wanted to be where no one knew who he was. He wanted to escape from himself. I'm going on to the other place, he said after a pause. Uh, uh on the wharf? Yes. That mad cat is sure to be there. They won't have her in this place now. Dorian shrugged his shoulders. Eh, I'm sick of women who love one. Women who hate one are much more interesting. Besides, the stuff is better. Nah, much the same. I like it better. Come on and have something to drink. I must have something. I don't want anything, murmured the young man. Never mind. Adrian Singleton 
rose up wearily and followed Dory into the bar. A half-caste in a ragged turban and a shabby ulster grinned a hideous greeting as he thrust a bottle of brandy and two tumblers in front of them. The woman sidled up and began to chatter. Dorian turned his back on them and said something in a low voice to Adrian Singleton. A crooked smile, like a melee crease, writhed across the face of one of the women. Ah, we are very proud tonight, she sneered. For God's sake, don't talk to me, cried Dorian, tramping his foot on the ground. What do you want, money? Here it is. Nah, don't ever talk to me again. Two red sparks flashed for a moment in the woman's sodden eyes then flickered out and left them dull and glazed. She tossed her head and raked the coins off the counter with greedy fingers. Her companion watched her enviously. It's no use, sighed Adrian Singleton. I don't care to go back. What does it matter? I'm quite happy here. You'll write to me if you want anything, won't you? said Dorian after a pause. Uh, perhaps. Good night, then. "'Good night,' answered the young man, passing up the steps and wiping his parched mouth with a handkerchief. Dorian walked to the door with a look of pain in his face. He drew the curtain aside. A hideous laugh broke from the painted lips of the women who had taken his money. "'There goes the devil's bargain,' she hiccoughed in a hoarse voice. "'Curse you,' he answered. "'Don't call me that.' She snapped her fingers. Prince Charming is what you'd like to be called, ain't it? She yelled after him. The drowsy sailor leapt to his feet as she spoke and looked around wildly. The sound of the shutting of the hall door uh, fell on his ear. He rushed out as if in pursuit. Dorian Gray hurried along the quay through the drizzling rain. His meeting with Adrian Singleton had strangely moved him, and he wondered if the ruin of that young life was really to be laid at his door. As Basil Hallward had said to him with such infamy of insult, he bit his lip, and for a few seconds his eyes grew sad. Yet, after all, what did it matter to him? One's days were too brief to take the burden of another's errors on one's shoulders. Each man was really wordy. Each man lived his own life and paid his own price for living it. The only pity was that one had to pay so often for a single fault. One had to pay over and over again indeed. In her dealings with the man, destiny never closed her accounts. There are moments, psychologists tell us, when the passion for sin, or for what the world calls sin, so dominates a nature that every fiber of the body, as every cell of the brain, seems to be instinct with fearful impulses. Men and women at such moments lose the freedom of their will. They move to their terrible and automatons move. A uh, choice is taken from them and conscience is either killed or, if it lives at all, lives but to give rebellion to its fascination and disobedience to its charm, period. For all sins, as theologians wearily not reminding us, are sins of disobedience. Uh, when that high spirit, that morning star of evil, fell from heaven as it was a re rebel that he fell, callous, Concentrated on evil, with stained mind and soul hungry for rebellion, Dorian Gray hastened on, quickening his step as he went. But as he darted aside uh, into a dim archway that had served him often as a shortcut to the ill-famed place where he was going, he felt himself suddenly sized from behind, seized <laughs> from behind, and before he had time to defend himself, he was thrust back against the wall with a brutal hand around his throat. He struggled madly for life, and by a terrible effort, wrenched the tightening fingers away. In a second he heard the click of a revolver, and saw the gleam of polished barrel, pointed straight at his head, and the dusky form of a short, thick-set man facing him. What do you, what do you want? he gasped. Eh, hey, keep quiet, said the man. If you stir, I'll shoot you. You are mad. What have I done to you? You wrecked the life of Sybil Vane. Oh, the brother's back, was the answer. And Sybil Vane was my sister. She killed herself. I know it. Her death is at your door. I swore I'd kill you in return. For years I have sought you. I had no clue, no trace. The two people who could have described you were dead. 
I knew nothing of you but the pet name she used to call you. I heard it tonight by chance. Make your peace with God, for tonight you are going to die. Dorian Gray grew sick with fear. I never knew her, he stammered. I never heard of her. You are mad. You had better confess your sin, for as sure as I am James Vane, you are going to die. There was a horrible moment. Dorian did not know what to say or do. Down on your knees, growled the man. Uh, I give you one more minute to make your peace, no more. I go on board tonight for India, and I must do my job first. One minute, that's all. Dorian's arms fell to his side, paralyzed with terror. He did not know what to do. Suddenly, a, a wild hope flashed across his brain. Stop, he cried. How long ago is it since your sister died? Quick, tell me. Eighteen years, said the man. Why do you ask me? What do years matter? Eighteen years, laughed Dorian. <laughs> With a touch of triumph in his voice, eighteen years. Set me under the lamp and look at my face. James Vane hesitated for a moment, not understanding what was meant. Then he seized Dorian Gray and dragged him from the archway. Dim and wavering, as was the wind-blown light, yet it served to show him the hideous error, as it seemed, into which he had fallen, for the face of the man he had sought to kill had all the bloom of boyhood, all the unstained purity of youth. He seemed little more than a lad of twenty summers, hardly older, if older indeed at all, than his sister had been when they had parted so many years ago. It was obvious that this was not the man who had destroyed her life, he loosened his hold and reeled back. My God, my God, he cried, and I would have murdered you. Dorian Gray drew a long breath. You have been on the brink of committing a terrible crime, my man, he said, looking at him sternly. Let this be a warning to you not to take vengeance into your own hands. Forgive me, sir, muttered James Vane. I was deceived. A chance word I heard on that damned den set me on the wrong track. You better go home and put that pistol away, or you might get into trouble, said Dorian, turning on his heel and going slowly down the street. James Vane stood on the pavement in horror. He was trembling from head to foot. After a little while, a black shadow that had been creeping along the dripping wall moved out into the light and came close to him with stealthy footsteps. He felt a hand laid on his arm and looked around with a start. It was one of the women who had been drinking at the bar. Why, why didn't you kill him? She hissed out putting haggard face quite close to his. I knew you were following him when you rushed out of dailies. You fool. You should have killed him. He has lots of money, and he's as bad as bad. He's not the man I'm looking for, he answered, and I want no man's money. I want a man's life. The man whose life I want must be nearly 40 now. This one's a little more than a boy. Thank God I have not got his blood upon my hands. The woman gave a bitter laugh. <laughs> a little more than a boy, she sneered. Why, man, it's nigh on 18 years since Prince Charming made me what I am. Yeah, you lie, cries James Vane. She raised her hand up to heaven. Before God, I'm telling the truth, she cried. Before God. Strike me dumb if it ain't so. He is the worst one that comes here. They say he's sold himself to the devil for a pretty face. It's nigh on eighteen years since I met him. He hasn't changed much since then. I have, though, she added with a sickly leer. Yeah, you swear this? I swear it. Came in a hoarse echo from her flat mouth. But didn't give me away to him, she whined. I'm afraid of him. Let me have some money for my night's lodging. He broke from her with an oath and rushed to the corner of the street. But Dorian Gray had disappeared. When he looked back, the woman had vanished also. Chapter 17 A week later, Dorian Gray was sitting in the conservatory at Selby Royal, talking to the pretty Duchess of Monmouth, who, with her husband, a jaded-looking man of sixty, was amongst his guests. It was tea time. 
and the mellow light of a huge, lace-covered lamp that stood on the table lit up the delicate china and hammered silver of the service at which the Duchess was presiding. Her white hands were moving daintily among the cups, and her full red lips were smiling at something that Dorian had whispered to her. <laughs> Lord Henry was lying back in a silk-draped wicker chair looking at them. Out of peach-colored divian sat Lady Narborough, pretending to listen to the Duke's description of the Brazilian beetle that he had added to his collection. Mm. Three young men in elaborate smoking suits were handling tea cakes to, or handing them to the, some women. The house party consisted of twelve people, and there were more expected to arrive on the next day. What are you, uh, what are you two talking about, said Lord Henry, strolling over to the table and putting his cup down. Oh, Dorian has told you about my plan for rechristening everything, Gladys. It is a delightful idea. But I don't want to be rechristened, Harry, rejoined the Duchess, looking up at him with her wonderful eyes. I am quite satisfied with my own name, and I am sure Mr. Gray should be satisfied with his. Ah, my dear Gladys, it would not alter either name for the world. They are both perfect. I was thinking chiefly of flowers. Yesterday I cut an orchid from my buttonhole. It was a marvelous spotted thing, as effective as the seven deadly sins. <laughs> In a thoughtless moment I asked one of the gardeners uh, what it was called. He told me it was a fine specimen of the Robinsonia, or something dreadful of that kind. It is a sad truth, but we have lost the faculty of giving lovely names to things. Names are everything. I never quarrel with actions. My one quarrel is with words. That is the reason I hate vulgar realism in literature. The man who, who could call a spade a spade should be compelled to use one. It is the only thing that it is fit for. Then what should we call you, Harry? she asked. His name is Prince Paradox, <laughs> said Dorian. I recognize him in a flash, exclaimed the Duchess. I won't hear it, cried Lord Henry, sinking into his chair. From a label, there is no escape. I refuse the title. Royalties may not abdicate. Fell is a warning from pretty lips. You wish me to defend my throne, then? Yes. I give the truths of tomorrow. I prefer the mistakes of today, she answered. You disarm me, Gladys, he cried, <laughs> catching the wilfulness of her mood. Of your shield, Harry, not of your spear. I never tilt against beauty, mm -hmm, he said with a wave of his hand. That is your error, Harry. Believe me, you value beauty far too much. How can you say that? I admit that I think it is better to be beautiful than to be good. But on the other hand, no one is more ready than I am to acknowledge that it is better to be good than to be ugly. "'Ugliness is one of the seven deadly sins, then?' cried the Duchess. "'What becomes of your simile about the orchid? "'Ugliness is one of the seven deadly virtues, Gladys. "'You, as a good Tory, must not underrate them. "'Beer, the Bible, and the seven deadly virtues made our England what she is. "'You don't like your country, then?' she asked. Uh, "'I live in it. Uh, "'That you may censure it is better?' Would you have uh, me take the verdict of Europe on it? He inquired. What do they say of us? That Tartuffe has emigrated to England and opened a shop. Is that yours, Harry? I give it to you. I could not use it. It is too true. You need not be afraid. Our countrymen never recognize a description. They are practical. They are more cunning than practical. Then they make up their ledger. They bound stupidity by wealth and vice by hypocrisy. Still, we have done great things. Great things have been thrust on us, Gladys. We have carried their burden. Only as far as a stock exchange, she shook her head. I believe in the race, she cried. It represents the survival of the pushing. It has development. Decay fascinates me more. What of art, she asked. It is a malady. Love, an illusion. Religion, the fashionable substitute for belief. You are a skeptic. Never. Skepticism is the beginning of faith. What are you? To define is to limit. Give me a clue. Thread snap. You would lose your way in the labyrinth. 
You bewilder me. Let us talk of someone else. Our host is a delightful topic. Years ago, he was christened Prince Charming. Ah, don't remind me of that, cried Dorian Gray. Our host is rather horrid this evening, answered the Duchess, coloring. I believe he thinks that Monmouth married me on purely scientific principles, and is the best specimen he could find of a modern butterfly. Well, I hope he won't stick pins into you, Duchess, cried laughed Dorian. Oh, my maid does that already, Mr. Gray, when she is annoyed with me. Hey, what does she get annoyed with you about, Duchess? The most trivial things, Gray. This whole conversation is completely insane. I have no idea what's going on. Uh, for the most trivial things, Mr. Gray, I assure you, usually because I come in at ten minutes to nine and tell her that I must be dressed by half past eight. How reasonable of her. You should give her a warning. I daren't, Mr. Gray. Why, she invents hats for me. You remember the one I wore at Lady Hillstone's garden party? You don't. Eh, but it's nice of you to pretend that you do. Well, she made it out of nothing. All good hats are made out of nothing. Ugh. <laughs> These comments where it's like they say something and then they just kind of add to it. Sort of like the idea of like, friends are everything. But I have too many friends. It's just like it doesn't make any sense. So all good hats are made out of nothing. Great. Like all good reputations, Gladys, interrupted Lord Henry, every effect that one produces gives one an enemy. To be popular, one must be a mediocrity. Not with women, said the Duchess, shaking her head. And women rule the world, I assure you, we can't bear mediocrities. We women, as someone says, love with our ears. Just as you men love with your eyes, if you ever love at all. It seems to me that we never do anything else, murmured Dorian. Ah, you never really love, Mr. Gray, answered the Duchess with mock sadness. My dear Gladys, cried Lord Henry, how can you say that? Romance lives by repetition, and repetition converts an appetite into art. Ugh. Besides, each time that one loves is only time one has ever loved. Difference of object has not altered singleness of passion and merely intensifies it. We can live in life with a great experience at best, and the best secrets of life is to reproduce the experience as often as possible. <sighs> it's just a book about people who love to hear themselves talk. Even when one has wounded by it, Harry, asked the Duchess after a pause. Especially when one has been wounded by it, answered Lord Henry. The Duchess turned and looked at Dorian Gray with curious expression in her eyes. What have you uh, to say to that, Mr. Gray? She inquired. Dorian hesitated for a moment. Then he threw back his head and laughed. Ha ha, I always agree with Harry, Duchess. Even when he's wrong, Harry is never wrong, Duchess. It does his philosophy make you happy? I have never searched for happiness. Who wants happiness? I have searched for pleasure. And found it, Mr. Gray? Often. Mm. Eh, too often. The Duchess sighed. I am searching for peace, she said, and if I don't go and dress, I shall have none this evening. Let me uh, get you some orchids, Duchess, cried Dorian, starting to his feet and walking down the conservatory. You're flirting disgracefully with him, said Lord Henry uh, to his cousin. You'd better take care. He is very fascinating. If he were not, there would be no battle. Greek beats Greek, then? I am on the side of the Trojans. They fought for a woman. They were defeated. There are worse things than capture, she answered. You gallop with a loose rein. Oh, God, this conversation. Pace gives life, was the repose. I shall write it in my diary tonight. What? <laughs> that a burnt child loves a fire. I'm not even singed. My wings are untouched. You use them for everything except flight. Courage has passed from men to women. It is a new experience for us. You have a rival. Who? He laughed. Lady Narborough, he whispered. She perfectly adores him. You fill me with apprehension. The appeal to antiquity is fatal to us who are romanticists. Romanticists? You have all the methods of science. Men have educated us. But now you explained you. Describe us as a sex, was her challenge. Sphinxes, without secrets. She looked at him, smiling. How long Mr. Gray is, she said. Let us go and help him. I have not yet told him the color of my frock. 
Ah, you must suit your frock to his flowers, Gladys. That would be a premature surrender. Romantic art begins with its climax. I must keep an opportunity for retreat. In the Parthian manner, they found safety in the desert. I could not do that. Women are not always allowed a choice, he answered. He hardly had he finished the sentence before. From the far end of the conservatory came a stifled groan, followed by the dull sound of a heavy fall. Everybody started up. The Duchess stood motionless in horror, and with fear in his eyes, Lord Henry rushed through the flapping palms to find Dorian Gray lying face downwards on the tiled floor in a death-like swoon. He was carried at once into the blue drawing room and laid upon one of the sofas. After a short time, he came to himself and looked round with a dazed expression. "'What has happened?' he asked. "'Oh, I remember.' Am I safe here, Harry? He began to tremble. Oh, my dear Dorian, answered Lord Henry. You merely fainted. That was all. You must have overtired yourself. You had better uh, not come down at dinner. I will take your place. No, I will come down, he said, struggling to his feet. I would rather come down. I must not be alone. He went into his room and dressed. There was a wild recklessness of gaiety in his manner as he sat at the table, but now and then a thrill of terror ran through him when he remembered that, pressed against the window of the conservatory like a white handkerchief, he had seen the face of James Vane watching him. Well, there you have it. Dorian uh, runs into a, another lover, maybe. It's another person that basically he ruined their life and uh, at an opium den. And uh, they're just kind of crabby at him. Don't want to be around him. Then uh, runs into James Vane, the brother who waited 18 years to finally try to kill the man that made his sister commit suicide. Uh, they gets tricked. So now Dorian's at a party and he can't stop thinking about him. Passes out, so scared of getting killed by James. So that's it. I think from now on, it'll be the story of the hunt. James Vane stalking and murdering uh, Dorian Gray. It's been a while since I've read this. I don't remember how it ends. So be sure to tune in next time as I power read this book uh, to find out what happens to Dorian Gray. Probably nothing good. 